I'm the relationship manager for the Miller Introduction to Judaism program here at American Jewish University. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you here this evening. We are going to have so much fun and I guarantee you'll all be dancing in your seats or standing up and dancing for this, what's gonna be a really fun event. But before we actually start, I just wanna again, welcome you all, tell you a little bit about American Jewish University for those of you who don't know about us. We are a gem in the center of Los Angeles and we offer many different types of educational opportunities. We have the Ziegler School of Rabbinics, we have our education programs, our business programs, and a and a fabulous arts um, department as part of our Wizen Center and as part of our university. And tonight we are going to have the absolute privilege of hearing from Sammy Miller and the congregation and Molly Miller. And we are going to be today, um, Dr. Rich Potter, Potter is actually going to be interviewing them and uh, Rich grew up in Southern Florida and attended the University of Florida, spent time in Paris, New York, Central America, and he earned a doctorate at the University of Illinois. During the five years that he lived in Panama, Rich worked as an independent video producer on a variety of commercial and nonprofit and artistic projects. His academic research focuses on community media, especially in Latin America, as a basis for envisioning democratic organizational models for media production and circulation. There's so much more to read about Rich. I invite you to go to our website to do so. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich and let him do the formal introduction of Sam and Molly, Sammy and Molly. So without further ado, Rich, it's all yours. Thanks, Deborah. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the introduction, but uh, if the audience is going to spend any time looking at anybody online, they should look at Sammy and Molly Miller, uh, and I'm thrilled that they're with us tonight. Uh, Sammy Miller leads Sammy Miller in the congregation. Uh, Molly, his sister, is a part of the congregation. Sammy is a Juilliard-trained uh, jazz drummer. Uh, he's Grammy-nominated, and he's played at the White House, the Hollywood Bowl, and the Lincoln Center um, with Titans of Jazz, and and uh, other genres of music. And Molly, not to be outdone, has a doctorate from USC in guitar, is the chair of the guitar department at the Los Angeles College of Music, has toured with Jason Mraz, Black Eyed Peas, uh, and she's now in the house band for Bachelor Nation show, Listen to Your Heart. Uh, and when she's not touring uh, with the congregation or in the studio or playing in that um, house band, the Molly Miller Trio is uh, touring or recording. They got an album coming out in 2021. So you can look for that after you're impressed tonight by Sammy and Molly. Thanks for being with us. Welcome to Biahad, guys. Thank you so much, Rich. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. So uh, Sammy Miller and the Congregation is a unique band. Um, and it, I think that comes from, Sammy, your attitude towards what music is, what it can be, what you want it to be. So can you tell us a little bit about where the band came from and how that came out of your attitude? Uh, starting with, you know, you're at Juilliard, you're learning to be a jazz drummer at the highest of, of levels, and, and what happens? Just, just fun. You know, the whole, the whole point of music is it should be joyful. That's what I love about it. That's what I liked as a kid. That's still what I like. And when I was uh, immersed in this conservatory, she was such incredible talent, but it was like, functionally, what are we doing to make people feel good? And so uh, people say, you know, if you, if you, rather than just complain about a problem, try to solve it. And so the band is essentially my solution or my suggestion of how we could present music, which is playful, joyful, humorous, and uh, deeply rooted in the tradition of jazz and just American music at large. So on your TEDx talk, uh, which I recommend to everybody if they want to learn more about the, the origination of the band, you have a line where you say, you know, you can play jazz, but we play jazz. So, so what is the, how important is, is play to you in, in the way that the congregation works and the type of music you create? It, it's uh, the, the band only works if we have more almost like a troupe mentality, like a theater troupe or a comedy troupe where uh 
you know, jazz is about improvisation, but we need to improvise in every element, not just in the notes we play and, you know, talking with each other or people changing parts or costumes, everything is fair game. And uh, like when you're a little kid and you're playing, I think it just should have that level of freedom when you're playing music. If you're not, I, you should do something else. That's why, <laughs> I mean, I would have become a, a, a tax attorney, right, Molly? Or we would become like our siblings, doctors and lawyers. <laughs> Uh, and so how many siblings are there? We're two of five. Yeah, so the five of us grew up playing music together. Yeah, in this exact room. We are quarantining in our parents' house right now. So we are at our parents' house in the, the our childhood band room. And the other three uh, were a little bit smarter than Molly us. was thrown into guitars right there by our older brother. Just yes. in this spot, you could see it. When I wasn't practicing. <laughs> no. uh, and, and how do you get along playing in the band together as siblings? I... I it's actually crazy to me how well we get along because, uh, you know, as kids, we would fight, but, um, this is a very unique relationship. We're a close family. Um, but you know, we tour together, we, to work together and be, a, and be family members is pretty intense, but it's beautiful, especially with music. Cause it's so vulnerable. You're so vulnerable. We don't fight really a little one last night, but not really, which is pretty crazy. Cause we've been spending three and a half months together nonstop. And yeah, I would say as far as touring, like, it's good to have someone in the band who just, who doesn't put up with any BS. I would say Molly, in, more than anyone, is just keeps things fair and democratic in a way. And not having my sister there, to be like, mm, I think it's a healthier dynamic to have her there. Well, well, I respect you if you can keep that uh, healthy relationship with so much time together. So tell us about the band. How many, pe how many people are in the band? What are the instruments? And, and what is the music like before we get to hear a little bit of it? Yeah, totally. So there's seven of us. Um, like you mentioned, it was when I was at Juilliard, I started this, the band. We were, um, we got a residency. I got a residency at Jazz Lincoln Center. And it was there I sort of collected all the other outcasts in the program. So Alfonso Horn's our trumpet player. He's an incredible musician. Um, again, study, you know, a protege of Wynton Marsalis. Been playing on Broadway. He's uh, played with Rihanna, all these kind of people. But he's, in addition to being a great trumpeter, he's also very theatrical, has an amazing voice. So he's a part of it. Ben Flox is a tenor saxophonist from uh, Santa Cruz. Sam Crittenden comes from DeKalb, Illinois, our trombonist. Uh, um, Molly here, our pianist David Leinerts from Indianapolis, Indiana, and our bass player Corbin Jones, who lives in LA. He's from Denver, Colorado, and uh, he finished his tour. We had to steal him away. He was on tour with Beyonce, and we said, Bay, please give us Corbin for a little bit. And that's our bass player. And uh, we're all deep lovers of jazz music, but I think all of us have an ear for some other stuff, and all of us like having a good time. So. It's a little less serious and a little bit more play than I think a traditional jazz show. And uh, I, I was, I've always grown up deeply into comedy. So that stuff is all part of what, it, what you experience. So if you look online, you listen to the music or you read about the band, the words that are gonna come up are gonna be authentic, joyful, uh, theatrical, uh, a lot of performance, fun, humorous, um, but, Joy is a word that, that comes up a lot. And I think that's part of what you're telling us about your, your perspective here. If it's not joyful, it's, it's not the kind of music you want to make. Uh, so the first song that Sammy and Molly are going to share with us tonight is one called Mr. Brass Man. And Sammy, when he explained to me the song, which is a brand new song, I'm not sure if you performed it for anybody. It was written during the quarantine. Uh, and, and it was about joy and missing a certain joy. So can you tell us the background of the song and then we'll get to hear it. Oh, just the band, I have the fortune to congregate with other musicians all the time, specifically uh, these incredible horn players, these brass players. And just in missing them, I realized, geez, how much they do for my soul and how, how much they give me sort of strength and give me, they uplift me. And so I just wrote a song to try to communicate some of what that's like. And obviously we don't have the instruments. I can't wait to do it with all seven of us, but you'll hear, we, we'll get it done. Okay, so let's hear Mr. Brassman without the brass. <laughs> One second while we get a little situated. Should I leave it there, Molly? Think, or yeah, put it back yeah, down? Not, no, it's not. It's not that good then. Yeah. Change 
two, two, two. You hear us all right? Mr. Brass Man, with your trombone, give me a feeling I'm not alone. It's been hard time in the city. I felt that nothing would ever lift me. And this is where the trombones would be doing all their things. Sunday morning, stuck in my bed, trying to get her out of my head. It's been eight weeks since we've spoken. My clock is ticking. This heart is broken. I was slipping. He comes sliding in the dark. There he shining, playful play day after day, my love for you won't fade away. Heartstrings ain't no faking. What's the real thing? He don't replay, he don't rewrite every evening. Could be his last night. When I was sipping, he comes sliding in the darkness. There he shining. Zoom crowd goes wild. On a side note, out there going wild. Thank you for that. Uh, I loved it. Thank you. So, a little taste of uh, Sammy Miller and the congregation, Mr. Brassman. Uh, I think this is the first time that Biahad has had live music played. I think that's the case. Uh, and we're also world premiering songs. So, uh, getting a lot done here tonight. Um, those of you in the audience, if you have questions, remember the Q&A is open. You can ask questions, and I'm going to incorporate the first question into uh, the next uh, into our, our next bit of discussion here, um, because I wanted to talk, Sammy and Molly, about the importance of authenticity in your music and about bringing in your own personal narrative. Uh, and so part of that, not all of it, of course, but part of that is that you grew up in Los Angeles in a Jewish family. Uh, and we're going to continue to talk about the importance of Judaism and the history of Judaism and music in the United States. Um, but Sammy, when we, when we talked a little bit the other day, 
you, you, you told me about, you know, when you, you said when you're 16 years old, your instinct is to hide yourself and to try to be just like Miles Davis or whichever jazz artist is out there that set the bar that, that you're trying to meet. Um, and so I, I want to connect that to the first question that Julia asked, which is, are you a fan of whiplash? <laughs> and, and what does it mean to be a teenager and to start exploring who you are and, and coming to, into your own as a jazz player? The whiplash question is um, that I think that I, it owes a second look for me. I'll say when I saw it, it was maybe a little too close to home. I had a teacher like that, uh, one of my professors, I'm not going to name names, but who would do stuff like that where he'd call me to have a 5 a.m. drum lesson in Brooklyn and then I'd show up and then he wasn't there, stuff like that. I mean, I had some of that just dysfunctional teacher stuff. Um, but I certainly can relate to that character as far as you become so immersed in a thing that you can lose yourself, I think. And uh, the thing that I've tried to do is pull back and say, well, like, look, what is, speaking of authenticity, what is different here? Like, not where am I similar to other people, but where am I different? Okay, well, first of all, I grew up playing in a family band. That's different. So I want my band to have that quality of just a familial quality, whether literally with Molly or with the people that I bring around to have that feeling. Um, and I think about my Jewishness, like I used to, I think when I was, this, there's not a lot of the music I connected to didn't have a Jewish, sort of shied away from um, Jewish history, I would say. Like jazz music, a lot of people think of as just a, a black American art form, but it's the beautiful thing that I was, was drawn to was the level of integration, even in that first wave of pioneers. Louis Armstrong got his first trumpet from his Jewish family. I mean, like, there, it's just mixed into the DNA of jazz. And I always try to bring that to us when we play all of that history. So uh, I'll ask David's question quickly here. He wants to know which era of Miles were, were you into and which Miles did you want to be like? Everyone's I've gone through every era of Miles. Like I like nine, now I like 1951 Birdland. If you want me to really jazz nerd out, I like before he knew who he was. I, I I'm I'm fascinated with artists before they figure out who they are. Molly, did you have the same experience? Were you, were you trying to emulate certain players before you came into your own? Yeah, I think that's a huge struggle. I definitely know I had a, a blossoming period. Uh, when I sort of realized this thing of not being afraid, because I think often on stage and even just alone in a practice room, um, it's so easy to be judging yourself right. before you can even get your idea out. And um, I had an epiphany one night when I was playing and I wasn't, I, I kind of had this screw it attitude of, you know what, this is me, take it or leave it. And it was one of the best like gigs I ever had. And so I always try to remember that. And my mantra often is like, don't be afraid, you know? And so, yeah, just be you. And it, it's so easy to say that, but it's so true with music. The more you can get out of your own way and just be yourself. I just want to add, Molly has one of the most incredible work ethics. She's saying that, that it's just about being yourself, but she like is in the practice room nonstop all day, figuring out who that self is. One of the aspects of who you are, Sammy, other than being a jazz nerd who can, you know, appreciate Miles at very specific moments in his career, is a comedy nerd who, uh, once you got into stand-up comedy, explored uh, the entire history of it and, and were immersed in it. And that, of course, has found its way into the music as well. Uh, the music uh, of Sammy Miller and the Congregation is, is often extremely humorous and performative. Uh, as is, I think, the next song that we're going to hear, uh, which connects some of these dots. The song is called Data Jew. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the, the history of that song? This song comes from uh, the album Leaving Egypt, Sammy Miller and the Congregation's album Leaving Egypt. Um, I, I write every single day, and a lot of the stuff I write is I never sees the light of day, and I'll just write little demos. I try to finish something. And this was a song I wrote about a year and a half, two years ago now. Wow. Um, I was in a relationship at that time with uh, a, young, a, young, a young woman who was a Muslim and I'm a Jew. And I was just thinking about um, sort of like the historical baggage of having people who come from different cultures. And I think everyone deals with that to a certain extent, even as small as like, oh, 
he's Sephardic and she's Ashkenazi. I think everyone deals with that at some level. And uh, so I, I wrote this song about, about being a, a Jewish person and what maybe you grew up hearing in, in your Hebrew school or from your family or maybe from your bubby. Everyone has their person who told them they should date a Jew or marry a Jew. And um, what was I gonna, and just sort of, yeah. I never also heard that song ever in a song. I never heard the word Jew in any song ever growing mm -hmm. up. And so I just thought it deserved to be heard in a song. Well, let's hear it in a song. Take it away. <laughs> Check it. said you gotta do date a Jew you gotta date a Jew one thing in this world her daddy said not to do date a Jew don't date a Jew we wasn't trying to disobey but love and love you it's funny that way. And there is one thing in this world I learned down in Hebrew school. Data Jew. You got data Jew. One thing in this world she learned down at her mom's. Don't even say it, boy. Don't data. He wasn't trying to cause a scene. But then Cupid struck, I just my luck, I found my queen. Mama might think it's cruel, daddy feels like a fool. For love, we gonna break the rule. Here comes the bright at night. Stay at And while these love songs come in all sorts of shapes, the contracts we sign, we can't break. Don't you make a mistake? Say I do. I do, I do. I say I do. I do, I do, I do. Say I do. Oh Lord, what are we gonna do now? Are we to run from love? And could you teach us how? Teach us how. Teach us how. Mama might think it's cool. Daddy feels like a fool. For love, we gonna break the rules. my love you better be kind my love how sublime my love to have it be Let me live my own way. You might say I 
I think it's time you give me a try. Cause if you get to know me, you'll see I'm not such a bad guy. Such a bad guy. Well, Carol uh, left a comment as you guys were playing that. I'm going to let her speak for me, too. She says, this does bring joy. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and thank you for playing that. Uh, and, and I'm glad you played it because it illustrates, you know, a very personal connection to Judaism that, that shows up in some of your songs. Um, but I know that, and you alluded to it earlier, we're talking about Louis Armstrong uh, getting his first instrument. But I know that you're, you're a bit of a student, Sammy, of the um, role of Jewish songwriters in the history of American music and particularly in the Great American Songbook. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've learned uh, in your studies of that and how it influences your music? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, first of all, I came to all that American Songbook music, which I'm sure folks here, everyone has an American Songbook song they love, Autumn Leaves or All the Things You Are. Cole Porter stuff, Cheek to Cheek, or uh, Irving Berlin, even just God Bless America. But um, I came to that music from a jazz uh, perspective. So it was mostly, I was hearing these songs instrumentally played and normally with notes changed, you're not like the actual Bible of how those songs were created. And at a certain point, um, as I got increasingly interested in the theatrical part and the comedic element of music, um, it sort of pushed me back to that period when music was presented not as um, so self-serious. And you see those early Broadway composers, there's sort of just a, a, a lightness and, a, and, a, and a, just a, a serious love of being alive, I would say. And you hear that it really comes through in their music. And Irving Berlin is someone who uh, I think is the, the epitome of that. And for us, I think, uh, Molly and I, we play a whole bunch of his music, but I, if people don't know much about him, he actually grew up, his dad was a cantor and he came here into the new world Obviously, there were some pogroms going on in Eastern Europe, and they were like, we got to get out of here. So they come to the United States and down to the Lower East Side, and uh, his father can't find work as a canner, and, and Irving ends up working very early. His father dies, and he just becomes obsessed with American music, ragtime music, uh, music that's going on in vaudeville. And he, I think, I would argue he uses that history, that rich musical history of cantorial music to help inform what he does. And I think um, here we are 100 years later, and I think pulling from everything that we experienced as kids growing up feels just the best way to approach music. Yeah, I, I, this gets at what I think is one of the most fascinating aspects of the congregation, your music, and the trajectory of it, which is, you know, we've been talking about authenticity is, is a theme and, and the importance of authenticity to any uh, musician. And you're going back to a set of musicians who are figuring out how to immerse themselves in a musical tradition that's not necessarily their own and who end up, uh, Sammy mentioned this in our earlier conversation, writing some of the most classic songs for the culture in ways that are clearly not their own. Some of the best Christmas songs, some of the, the Christmas songs you'll hear most in the mall on Black Friday will have been written by some of these Jewish songwriters. Uh, and yet you're pointing to that as a moment of, in some ways, greater authenticity of the music than later on in the 20th century. Uh, and so if I'm not getting too pedantic uh, about this, can, can I get you, either of you, to comment a little bit on, on how you see that? I just think those, that group of musicians, first of all, it was sort of the Wild West. So um, you had to pull anything and anything, and any and all and anything or whatnot. To, to find your mark. And I think people like Irving Berlin or Gershwin's the same bag, uh, Jerome Kern, they are so freaking excited to be in America. And I think that jubilation comes through in the music from, and we're gonna play a song from Annie Get Your Gun. I think that's a great example where this song, there's no business like show business. I think you hear this guy is just so bloody excited to be in this new world. And he's like, folks, don't you all see how incredible this thing is? And, I, and I've always felt that joy is an infectious emotion. Um, in the same way, I think he, his music is infectious with joy. I, I want to be doing the same thing. 
Um, and I think I should say a lot of artists today, there's a lot more concern with being cool. And that's cool, but that's not the art that I like. So the song that you're about to play, I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night from the musical Annie Get Your Gun. Uh, Molly, you want to tell us a little bit about how you are going to, how you play this song, how you interpret it, uh, and how you connect to that older tradition? Well, what Sammy and I have been exploring a lot the last few months is how to get a big sound and play all these different parts and make these two instruments a whole orchestra. So, uh, and this, I don't know, are you talking, we can talk a little bit about the form. If you guys pay attention, the form is A-A-B-A. -A so there'll be a bridge section and we play the form down twice. Um, yeah, but this song, I think, has been a good reminder for Sammy and I, and hopefully for you guys, just, you know, we don't have a lot of the things we're used to right now, but you got the sun, you got the moon, we have trees. There are these basic things that can remind us of how fortunate we are just to be alive and be here. Okay. Let's hear it, please. Got no mansion, got no yacht. Still, I'm thankful for what I got. I got the sun in the morning and the moon at night. Got no diamonds, got no pearls. Still, I feel like I'm a lucky girl. The sun in the morning and the moon at night. Sunshine gives me the lovely day. Moonlight, and now I got the Milky Way. Got no checkbook, got no bank. Still, I want to go and give the AJU something. Sun, morning, and the moon at night. there. I'm not sure that uh, if I hadn't known it, I'd, I'd have attributed that to Irving Berlin. Uh, but that is Irving Berlin. I got the sun in the morning, the moon at night from Annie Get Your Gun, the musical. Uh, and this, this dive and appreciation for those songwriters um, has contributed at least uh, to a new move for Sammy Miller, uh, which is writing a musical of his own. Uh, so, Sammy, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your musical, uh, which is The Last Medicine Show? Where did it come from? What it's, what's it about? And what are your goals with it? Totally. Well, um, so like we've been talking about, the band has a lot of theatrical elements. And uh, maybe four or five years ago, I was like, we need to figure out how to stage the jazz band experience. How do we take the jazz band out of the club and turn it into a 
in your face theater immersive experience. Um, and that piece of work that we worked on called Great Awakening um, got the attention of Ars Nova. So I don't know if folks know, but they're incredible um, theater organization in New York City. They did Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet. They did K-pop, a lot of just kind of eccentric pieces and eccentric creators. And uh, the head of Ars Nova came to me and he said, what would be the scariest thing you could do? He said, what, what scares you the most? And I said, to write an original musical. And he said, cool. And then two weeks later, I got this commission notice that he wanted us to do this original musical. Uh, and it's essentially, it's the story of a ragtag modern jazz band, us. And we're telling the story of The Last Medicine Show. And um, for folks who don't know, basically in the 19th century, if you lived in rural America, the only entertainment you were going to get were medicine shows. And it would, a uh, huckster would come to town, he would have bottles to sell you of different snake oils. But if uh, you sat through, you'd get a free show. And they would bring these performers, different vaudeville performers, all different styles. They would come together and try to put on these one night only shows to sell you these um, drugs. But in the process, our story follows uh, a young Jewish boy, Benji Bloomstein, who uh, his father, they flee much like Irving Berlin and those folks, there are pogroms in Russia and they flee to Youngstown, Ohio, where his father is the one doctor in town. And uh, young Benji sees a medicine show for the first time and decides he must join a medicine show. So he leaves his father's medical practice to go join this quack doctor instead and joins entertainment. So that's the story that we're going to follow. It's Benji Bloomstein's story. And, you know, what fascinates me about that story, and I look forward to seeing the musical, is, is that it seems to incorporate some of these themes that we've been talking about, this question of authenticity. Father's a real doctor, kid falls in love with, with the quack doctor, wants to run off with him, right? Wants to immerse himself in a culture that's not necessarily his own, but loves it. And as, as a scholar of media, I know that um, snake oils and, and, and early quack medicine products were one of the driving forces behind the rise of advertising in the mid 19th century. And, uh, you know, the, the lies or, or half truths that we tell in, in the United States to sell products uh, and that drive our culture and, and that drove our culture all the way through the 20th century and, and up to now. Uh, and so it, it just seems like there's a lot of play around this idea about what is authentic, what is true versus what is not, and, and that it's maybe not always so easy to tell. Um, you nailed that. Well, you said it better than I've ever said it. Anytime I've explained the show, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm available for hire if you want me to travel around and give that sound bite. Uh, Molly, what was your role in developing the musical? You know, I was not a big, a big part of developing it. Sammy uh, lives, has lived in New York the last 10 years and moved out here a year ago about. Um, so yeah, he was out in New York developing it with the rest of the congregation while I was in Los Angeles living my life. Sammy, what scared you so much about writing a musical? Because of those giants. And there's so many perfect musicals. Uh, and I think if you're going to contribute to a form, you have to say there has to be a reason for a person to go see The Last Medicine Show instead of seeing Annie Get Your Gun or instead of seeing Oklahoma or instead of seeing Hello, Dolly. I mean, the, 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 the bar is so high. And I think those geniuses just, just, just incredible, uh, just incredible genius, you know, that's all. And um, I think as a jazz musicians, we can often hide behind the quality of our improvisations. So just trying to make sure the material is as strong as the improvisation. Well, we get a chance to put it to the test. You just heard Molly and Sammy do one of Irving Berlin's. Now we're gonna have them do one of theirs. Uh, this is Dreams Don't Always Have to Stay as Dreams from The Last Medicine Show, the new musical. I'll remind the audience that the Q&A is open. Uh, got some questions that I hope we'll have some time to get to. If you have other questions, please put them in now uh, and we'll, we'll get to those after this song. But here we go with dreams don't always have to stay as dreams from the last medicine show. Two, two, two. Can you hear me okay? I'm using a children's size uh, chair. So this is Benji Bloomstein. He's just seen the medicine show. Doc Washington's All American Fix. And he's like, I got to leave this small town. And he says, uh, 
Pa tells me I'm so lucky, oh, to live in such a town, Youngstown. Well, soon I'll be the doc, your wife. Two kids, I'll settle down. But to settle would be defeat. And all I've ever dreamed. And dreams don't always have to stay as dreams. I dream of Savannah with them real old squares. We'd set the tent and spread our intent to heal those days. I dream of Philly with a big old bell. Sales would be great and we would celebrate down at the Liberty Hotel. I dream of Denver where the air is dry. Along the arduous path where Rebel would laugh and tell old time tales. I dream of Cleveland learning from the dock. He'd share his tricks, all his secret tips he never ever yet taught. Come on, please don't tell me how. I'm sitting with my one guy. Let me fail and leave this trail. They call my own life. I'm headed out see what the land is all about. Dreams don't always have to stay as dreams. Na -na -na, dreams don't always have to stay as dreams. Here we go. I dream of Boston where they party with tea. I'd sing a song, Critches might be wrong, but they would still love me. I dream of anywhere but this tired old town. Take me east, west, north, south, south, anywhere but homeward bound. Come on, come on. Please don't tell me how I'm to live my one life. Chicka, 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 I will admit that I uh, have not always been the biggest fan of musicals, but I am a big fan of Americana and I want to see this musical. Uh, so musicals these days sometimes can turn into film opportunities and I'll use that as an introduction to uh, the question from Julia who asks, what are your favorite John Williams soundtracks and how do you think music can affect emotions when watching a film like Schindler's List or Jojo Rabbit? And I'll add on, do you have ambitions to move into the film world as you explore the things that scare you? Um, well, starting with the, we'll go backwards. Yeah, 
I think, uh, I, I think um, I grew up as a kid, probably the musicals that had the biggest impact to me were first Disney musicals, honestly. And those are incredibly well written. Uh, <laughs> the Lion King, those songs are perfect songs and same goes for Snow White, all those other masterpieces. Um, John Williams and just, the, I would say that the, my favorite example is Quentin Tarantino with Pulp Fiction, he chose the music before he wrote the scenes. That's just how powerful I think music can be to set the mood. You want to add anything on that? Brian? Oh yeah, I feel like within the question when you, it was something about the emotional aspect of music, I, it, like it sets the tone and how much more powerful whatever you're viewing, I feel like what you hear tells you more information. My favorite soundtrack ever, uh, movie soundtrack, is actually the Oh Brother, Where Art Thou soundtrack, speaking of Americana. I mean, talk about just, um, if folks don't know that, that's an incredible film, Coen Brother film, but just that soundtrack T-Bone Burnett put together is just perfection. Yeah, speaking of uh, Jewish guys who, who got into Americana and, and produced some of the best there is of, of, of that stuff. Uh, guys, we're at the end of our, our 45 minutes. Uh, so I'll have to hold the rest of the questions I'd like to hear about. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for spending the time with us uh, and for being vulnerable and, and authentic. Um, and I'll remind everybody that you can get a lot more Sammy Miller and the Congregation online. There's a TEDx talk, there's albums, uh, and they tour relentlessly. Uh, and if I said that they played the Lincoln Center and the Hollywood Bowl and places like that, uh, they will also play your, your dive bar and your local middle school. Uh, and they're proud of playing places like that as well. So look for them when touring is able to happen again. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Deb. And uh, I know you had one more song in line. It was one of Molly's, When You See Me. So Deb, if we can, I'll let you close this off. And then they can play that last song. And, and we'll end it there. Perfect. So I want to thank Rich. Thank you so much for bringing this, Sammy and Molly. This was so enjoyable. I told people that they were gonna, you know, have fun and, and you delivered. And I wanna thank AJU, American Jewish University, for creating this Biyaha Together online platform where we are able to bring all sorts of interesting content to our viewers, whether it be deep philosophical discussions, or uh, text study, music is so important to our soul. And I think what you've done here tonight is, is bring music to, to first certainly my soul, but to everyone's soul. And it is such a Jewish value and such a Jewish um, joy is music and bringing it to us. So on behalf of AJU, I wanna thank you all and looking forward to hearing this one last song. Thank you all so much. It's such a pleasure. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Rich, everybody. Fun.
Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a great night.